It's been quite a while since we, we did a view on Africa on Burundi. And the reason to look at it again now is largely because it's been a year since the African Union focused on Burundi um, quite significantly at its summit in January last year. Of course, the AU summit is um, kicking off this week in Addis again. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to look at some of the um, progress or absence of progress that has been made on trying to stabilize the situation in Burundi over the last year. So um, the, the primary theme of this, uh, of this view on Africa will be looking at where we are now. I'll speak about the um, mediation of the East African, by the East African community. Um, I'll be looking at the domestic situation, whether things have changed there, improved there or not, the economic situation and some of the developments in the political opposition uh, over the last few months. So um, just to kick off and to remind everybody, about a year ago now um, at the African Union Summit, after the PSC had um, voted to deploy the Maprobu force, the African Union uh, Summit of Heads of State then reversed that decision essentially within the, the Peace and Security Council, and we never ended up seeing um, the deployment of Maprobu. Uh, the, the AU then initiated um, a high-level panel of heads of state visit to Burundi to follow up on Maprobu with the view to potentially um, uh, muting another kind of AU deployment to try and, uh, to try and stabilize the situation and, and put, uh, also at that point to try and um, um, establish a presence along Burundi's borders. This visit took place in uh, February. Uh, five heads of state went, including Jacob Zuma. Unfortunately, there was no significant follow-up on that. So that um, initiative also didn't bring any significant change to the situation in Burundi. The last element of the African Union um, involvement in the in Burundi was the um, or is the deployment of human rights observers and of military observers to that country. Now that is a decision that had been taken already in 2015 when the Burundi crisis was at its at its uh, height in the sense that there were still protests in the street. Um, at that point, the African Union had decided to send. Um, 50 human rights observers and 50 military observers to try and stabilize the situation and, and, and act as a, as a preventative measure. Um, that deployment to, to this date has not been fully completed. So in other words, we still have only a, a small percentage of human rights observers from the African Union and a small percentage of the military observers from the African Union who are on the ground. So all in all, I would say that the African Union's efforts uh, to make a substantial uh, inroads into the, the um, Burundi crisis have not, not come to much over the last year. Um, parallel to those efforts um, have been those of the East African community. So the East African community is the primary body concerned with trying to resolve the crisis in, the, in Burundi, and the EAC has led the international mediation efforts there um, under President uh, Yoweri Museveni from Uganda, um, and the person who is actually leading the facilitation on a day-to-day -day basis is a former Tanzanian president, Benjamin Nkapa. Now, Nkapa had a few attempts uh, last year to, to uh, convene all the different players um, to, to, to less, less success. Uh, I won't go into too much detail about those. We've discussed those in the past. Um, but he has tried to pick that up, those efforts up again. The, the real sticking points have been um, both the agenda of those talks and also who actually gets to sit around the table. And I'll just remind you that the government essentially is saying that it won't sit around the table with members of the armed opposition, which is a, a description it uses for most of the political opposition. And the political opposition mostly having um, voiced this through the Senared, uh, wants the issue of the legitimacy of Nkurunziza's current mandate to be one of the negotiating uh, points, uh, which the government clearly rejects. So Mkapa went back to Burundi uh, at the end of 2016 to try and get the process started again after months of, of very little progress. Um, while he was there, he met with um, the opposition that is still present in Burundi. There's not very much opposition and uh, left in the country, but and not very much civil society. Um, but he also made a statement about how the um, legitimacy of Nkurunziza's third mandate would not be on the agenda of the Arusha talks, of the EAC-led talks. 
Um, now, this was a statement that very quickly was um, interpreted by the Sinared and by civil society as being um, as indicating favoritism on Nkapa's part towards the government, and it has really created another um, obstacle to getting everybody back to the table. Now, that said, I think that Mkapa was expressing a view that is relatively widely held within the international community. Um, there is no sense that this has to be one of the points um, uh, on the negotiating table. That is not a position that the international community is pushing. Um, it's really uh, something that is coming from the Burundian parties um, to, to the situation. Um, so I think that Mkapa probably um, made a bit of a false step by speaking out publicly what many in the international community already have accepted since those elections did take place uh, a year and a half ago now. Um, after having that uh, initial contact meeting in December in Burundi, um, Mkapa then tried to convene the, the main parties, the main political opposition to a meeting, a pre-summit meeting, if you will, um, in Arusha again last week. Uh, he failed to, to get any kind of real quorum there. There were a few members of the um, Burundian opposition that are still in the country who did attend, but the Senared uh, refused to, to travel to Arusha. So again, not very much progress. Um, I think that it, it is an issue um, also with regards to the credibility of Mkapa and the East African community um, himself, uh, itself, um, that this question of the third mandate has been, um, that it's sort of a foregone conclusion that the mediation has made, that that won't be an issue on the agenda. And I think it will make it much more difficult um, to give that process legitimacy and to get everybody around the table. Um, having said that, there are, of course, different views, um, even within the, the political um, opposition in Burundi. Some are of the view that it's important just to go to the talks because Burundians are suffering and it's time to, to, to move on from this crisis and to find a resolution. Um, and others simply aren't, aren't budging. Um, at that, uh, one of the things that Mkapa had wanted to discuss is the, the way forward. And that, he has said, would involve the formation of a government of national unity. So that's one of the important details that would be on the table uh, if and when the East African community mediation does resume. So the formation of a government of national unity. Um, in, in terms of uh, the internal inter-Burundian inter dialogue process that is going on, as, as many of you will know, that started in January last year. It has always lacked uh, credibility and has uh, widely been seen by civil society and the political opposition as um, a, a government-led and government-influenced process that cannot be a legitimate um, way out of the current crisis. Uh, the process should be winding up soon. Um, we know that it, um, its recommendations, its midterm recommendations, if you will, um, involved um, things such as the constitution is, um, should, take, um, question, should, should take precedence over the Arusha Accords, and that it, has probably, it will likely recommend the suppression of the Arusha Accords. Now that is, um, would be a very dramatic change for Burundi. Um, and it's one of the issues that uh, the East African community and the international community um, very clearly believe that uh, Arusha should not be touched and that it is a good blueprint for, for um, let's say, ethnic balance in Burundi that has served the country uh, very well. So that uh, internal process is, 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 it should be winding down. And of course, um, you know, it's, it's worrisome because if that process is then um, legitimized by parliament, um, and if there are certain numbers of um, political opponents or political parties, I should say, in the country who do legitimize that, then it is very likely that the Nkuru and Ziza government will see that as its, its path forward. Um, and it may even choose to say, we no longer need to come to the internationally mediated talks led by the EAC because we have concluded our own internal process. And that would be another way of kind of locking the crisis in. Uh, clearly the uh, political opposition, um, the Senared, um, would not accept that, nor would large numbers of civil society. And I think the international community would also uh, not accept that. And so essentially the deadlock would remain and, and likely worsen if the, if the Arusha Accords were to be scrapped. Um, I want to describe a little bit what we do know is happening in, in, in the country. Um, 
President Nkurunziza gave a speech at the end of last year in which he remained very hard line with, in his views. And what he raised is the fact that he may even run for a fourth mandate. Now, it's still quite a long time until we get to that point. It would be 2020. But I think simply uh, mooting it does have a, an impact on, on how people, where people sense things are going. Um, I, I, I think it can both... Uh, shore up support for Nkurunziza, but it could also make things more complicated for him within his own party, which of course is experiencing firsthand uh, the impact of this third mandate of the, of the withdrawal of international donor assistance and of the essential isolation of Burundi on a number of different fronts. So this third mandate is coming already at a very high cost for the civilians of Burundi, but of course also for the ruling party. Um, and the, 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 um, Nkurunziza's uh, expressed desire to potentially go for a fourth mandate, I think, is a, is, is a very contentious issue. Um, the other really important element um, is the deteriorating economic situation within the country. Um, prices are rising uh, considerably on a very regular basis. Um, taxes are being uh, increased, taxes on, on, on small time business, business people, even people who are riding motorcycle taxis are being increased. People are being squeezed quite severely by the, the, the Burundian state in, in the Burundian state's attempt to try and um, shore up its treasury. It's in a very difficult position, as we've said before, close to 50% of Burundi's um, uh, annual budget is supported by international donors. And as we know, the EU and a number of other important bilateral funders have withdrawn um, that, that, that funding and are at this point not considering uh, reestablishing that funding. Um, and just a quick aside on that, in terms of reestablishing that funding, especially for the, the, the European Union, um, certain key um, measures would have to be would have to be taken notably reopening the media that have been closed um, and, and allowing people who have gone into exile to return um, and a general tangible improvement in political freedoms and freedom of expression um, again the indications that we are seeing from within burundi do not give us reason to believe that that is the direction in which the burundian government is headed at this point so the absence of budgetary support from international donors is likely to be a feature in 2017 and it will determine how well or how poorly that economy uh, continues to function now it's important because Burundi uh, did not have a, a lot of, of cushioning uh, economically. It's, it's, a, it's a relatively poor country. It doesn't have a huge number of resources. It's very reliant on its neighbors, on the East African community, but also donor aid. And so this, this prolonged economic crisis in the absence of, of budgetary support has, a, has a, a direct impact on services that p citizens can access and on a variety of other very um, tangible day-to-day -day issues for people. Now, the longer the crisis goes on, the harder it will be for the CNDD, FDD to continue to, I think, shore up its popular support. And we do know that that support does exist. And again, that will then have reverberations within the party itself. So I think it's a dangerous, uh, it's a risk element for the Burundian government, for Nkurunziza's government, um, uh, this economic crisis. Um, and I'll come back to that a little bit later as well when I, I talk about the Amazon issue, um, which has elements of, of this in it as well. Um, we also uh, have, at the end of last year, a number of different um, reports on uh, the scale of human rights violations. We have indications from within the country, um, the, the few civil society and media organizations that are still there um, have been trying very hard to document ongoing human rights violations in um, in Burundi, the Ligi Teka was recently banned, which is one of the, the last remaining credible uh, human rights organizations. But we do know that, you know, for example, Iwachu and other media there are trying to uh, shine the spotlight on the ongoing human rights violations. So we do know that in the provinces, uh, which of course are, are, are much harder to get information about than the capital, um, political members of political parties uh, that are not the ruling party are regularly harassed. They're prevented from um, convening meetings. They are um, often um, dragged in by police for several days and some have disappeared. So we have um, no sense that there has been a, um, an improvement in the human rights situation at all over the last year. And again, in a, in a context where 
um, those watchdogs that did exist, both local and international, have um, increasingly um, difficult access to document those types of human rights violations. So it's a very worrisome uh, blackout, I would say, on exactly what is happening in that field um, in Burundi. Um, that too makes it all the more imperative that the East African community mediation try to do its best to get the parties back to the table. Um, this week, the Burundian government released uh, several hundred prisoners. I think the total figure that they intend to release is 2,500. Um, it's, of course, uh, one of those um, elements, I think, that they believe speaks to the EU's concerns about the political and human rights environment. Um, one, one wonders what the reasoning for it is. Uh, the, the, some of the prisoners who have been released include members of the MSD, an opposition party um, led by Alexis Sinduige, who were arrested in 2014, quite a long time ago, um, while staging a protest in Bujumbura at that time already around um, concerns around political freedoms. They've been in prison for nearly three years and have now been released. The reaction of the civil society and of the political opposition is essentially, you know, this is too little too late. None of these people should have been in prison to begin with. They're political prisoners. And also that it's a, it's, it's an, it's a cheap attempt by um, by the government to try and curry favor with the international donors. Now, that last element is interesting because, because given the economic crisis, but coupled with Nkrumah Ziza's hardline stance on the mediation uh, or the EAC talks and, and, and the political opposition, what exactly does this tell us about where the Nkrumah Ziza government is right now? Is this, is this a sign that they really are growing desperate around the, about the economic situation, this release of the prisoners, and that they are trying to gain ground with um, international donors? And if so, is this as far as they're willing to go, or could this be the beginning of some tangible improvement in, in the environment? So it's just a question that we ask in the context of that prisoner release. Um, I'll, I'm almost uh, about to wrap up, and then I'll take the questions that I already have here. Um, I just want to mention two more things. Um, early, uh, well, over the weekend, over this past weekend, the Senared, um, members of civil society and um, members of the uh, Burundian diaspora met in Brussels or in Belgium and held a three-day meeting uh, to discuss um, how best to address this deadlock, this um, now very entrenched crisis in Burundi. Um, they did not emerge with a common platform, um, but they have um, come up with um, some organizational structures, um, and um, with, with the idea that um, they, they have a, a committee on conciliation and mediation, which will be led by Pierre Claver and Bounimpa, who's a very um, credible figure in the Burundian opposition, uh, a civil society leader. Um, and there are a few other um, I, a common action plan as well that they will be um, presenting. We don't yet have the details of that. But this is, I think, positive. Um, I, I think that um, any attempt to try and um, come up with concrete steps for the way forward is, is, is what needs to happen now. We've had people camped on their positions for a very, very long time, and that has prolonged the suffering of people in Burundi and worsened um, an economic and humanitarian crisis. So we, we, we wait to see what comes out, uh, what that common action plan is. Um, but it is, I think, probably uh, a sign that the Senared realizes that it hasn't been very successful in pushing things forward, uh, that it needs to make space for other voices within uh, or on its platform, um, and that it is also time to take another uh, real push at trying to unlock the situation. So we, we will be watching that closely. Then finally, on the Amazon payments, um, this was... Um, this, so Burundi has, of course, a large contingent, I think, of 5,000 troops as part of the Amazon uh, mission. Uh, they are very important to that mission and to the AU as a result, and of course, also to the UN and the international community. Um, it's been a real boost to the Burundian military to be able to participate in that mission and to be able, therefore, to have um, slightly higher income than they would have if they had simply been in Burundi. And so it's created a, an invested middle class within the army and a professional invested middle class within the army, um, which, of course, also plays into political dynamics in, in Burundi. The Amazon payments um, are, uh, are made, the, the, the salary payments to Amazon are made for the Burundians are made by the EU. And as part of its um, withdrawal of support to the government, it 
froze those salaries last year because it no longer wanted to pay those to Burund, the Burundian government, which then uh, had been paying them to the Burundian soldiers. Now, that means that these soldiers have had 12 months of salary arrears, which is a significant amount. Um, and Burundi, at the start of 2017, made um, new threats that it would start withdrawing its uh, contingent from Amasom if that could not be resolved. Um, so Commissioner Smile Shergi, PSC Commissioner AU, Peace and Security Commission Commissioner Smile Shergi, traveled to Burundi last week um, to discuss a variety of issues, but I think primarily to try and get agreement with the Burundian government on how best to address this so that uh, Burundi could continue to participate in Amazon. They do, um, they have signed a memorandum of understanding, which uh, the EU has also accepted. So from now on, those salaries will, con will, will be paid again. Um, the details of how those will be paid uh, is, is not yet something that we know. Um, but I think it was a, a, a very important thing for Burundi to secure because it uh, obviously um, the, the soldiers on the ground will be making the connection between their salary arrears and the political crisis in their country. And so that would have had um, the potential to play into um, the tensions in Burundi. And of course, for, uh, for everybody else, it's a relief because Burundi is an important component of Amazon. Um, and like I said, I think, um, you know, that it, 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 it indicates, I think, the, the fact that the Burundian government um, went so far as to say, well, withdraw from Amazon, which if it had had to do that, uh, would have had uh, potentially destabilizing repercussions in Burundi. I think it's a measure uh, of just how um, the, the, the certain elements, I would, should say, of the government are beginning to understand that the status quo is starting to fall apart and uh, that, that the um, implications for Nkuru Nziza and his ability to stay in office and the government's ability to maintain the situation could, could, uh, could be very difficult. So that's why I mentioned it also at the end of this um, presentation.